So, Luis, uh, would you like to share your audio and video? Then we're going to hear from uh, Luis on how um, on the journey that that Brancas has taken in building um, uh, payment services and some of the um, some of the interesting aspects of doing this in in different countries. Uh, Luis, would you like to share your screen now? Yes. Uh, one moment. Uh, all right. Uh, can everyone, uh, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. Okay. Let's... That's right. Awesome. Uh, over to you. Okay. All right. I'm going to go through this really uh, fairly quickly because uh, a lot of content to go through. All right. So hi, everyone. I'm Luis uh, Araneta. I work at, I work with Broncos. Um, and uh, I'm going to be giving, it's like, I'm just going to be giving you like, as, as John had mentioned, like a quick overview of kind of like what our, how, what our journey was and trying to build like this kind of uh, connected payment solution across Southeast Asia, uh, across Southeast Asia. All right. So um, the first thing that's really important to know first before I get into any detail, uh, before I get into any advanced detail is kind of like what our what Broncos's aspiration is right and it's like we've always identified ourselves as kind of like the open banking company it's like we want to be the guys that bring open banking op the concept of open banking into into southeast asia right so i can't go uh i can't go ahead without kind of giving uh giving a brief explanation on kind of like how do we what do we conceive how do we conceive open banking right it's like what that framework is that what our guide uh guiding principle is but so um and again, the thing that you're seeing on the screen is not quoted from anywhere. This is kind of me trying to synthesize kind of like our internal philosophies about things, right? But essentially open banking, uh, as we conceive it, right, is a system of enabling third-party access to consumer banking data and assets via application programming interface, like just API-based uh, banking services, or digital banking services, right? Uh, based on the core assertion that consumers, um, consumers are ultimately the owners of their banking data and their assets. Right, and in terms of implementation, it's like there are two things that were that are really important to us. Right, it's like one is that any open banking implementation, and it's like there's a lot of variability in the technical implementation of these open banking of these open banking APIs. But the most important ones, for uh, from our perspective, right, is that it is that implementation is built on two things. One, it is built on a strong on a strong customer authorization mechanism. Right, uh, that's typically. Um, in some parts of the world, in some, in a, it's like this is typically a variation, some kind of uh, implementation of like an OAuth two authorization code grant. Although it's like the implementations are very different, can be very different across different countries, where open banking as a framework has been is already established, right? But it's like it all essentially boils down to the same thing. It's an OAuth. It's essentially an OAuth two authorization code grant type um, authentic uh, flow. Right, and it's like via, and that is what what that is what secures access to banking data by third part to, to by third parties. Right. Additionally, another important component of this one is in explicit and informed end user consent. Right. Uh, consumers being the owners of their data, being the owners of their banking data, of their banking assets. Right. Before any kind of operation needs to be done, it, it can be done on these assets. Right. Consent, explicit and informed end user consent, uh, owner's consent needs to be expressed, right? And it's like that's kind of like what has been has been guiding our product development uh, for oh, about a close to a year now, actually, since we've pro properly launched Broncos Direct. I think it's a uh, Broncos Direct, it's like, uh, Broncos Direct, which is our direct debit debit payment solution, and also uh, Broncos Statements. It's uh, just shy of a couple of months, uh, you know, from being one year old. Right. But essentially, that's what how we conceive open banking, right? So, API-based digital banking services backed by strong customer authentic uh, auth authentication and authorization always it's like always requires informed and explicit consent from the end user, right? And built on the fundamental philosophy that uh, banking assets, uh, whether that's data or actual money, it's like that is owned by the end user. That's not the property of the bank who can put proper limitation, who can put limitations on how end user should spend, uh, should use that, should use those assets. 
Um, that's so that's in general our idea as our idea for open banking, right? The next one is like the next thing I kind of want to talk about is kind of like operationally, like it's like as a business, it's like what does that exactly translate to, right? It's like so in our mind, it's like we've split kind of like our we've we've identified two key sides of the equation, right? Which is basically the supply side and the demand side. The supply side being, you know, banks and FIs providing these API providing these APIs, right? Exposing them to third and exposing them to third parties so that third parties like fintechs. Uh, you know, various applications like e-commerce, peer-to-peer lending, et cetera, right? That they can build advanced financial applications on top of these core APIs. Brancos ideally sits somewhere in the middle, right? We enable banks, financial institutions, the supply side basically to enable these digital banking capabilities, right? And we provide easy access to these capabilities to the demand side. So your fintechs, uh, you, you know, your it's like your various enterprises that would have a use case for this for these for access to this kind of data and banking assets, basically, right? Whether that's as simple as just a payments use case or something more complex, right? Like, uh, I don't know, um, alternative credit, et cetera, right? Uh, this is where we kind of hit like a bit of a, uh, it's like, uh, before I uh, get into, it's like, so, in this equation for open banking, it's like all countries. Uh, we've we're actually present in three major three countries here in Southeast Asia right now, and Indonesia being one of them. But there's also Philippines and Thailand. And one of the things that we've discovered is that all of these countries are different are are basically different. Like when trying to figure out what the path to open banking uh, to enabling open banking for these countries are, it's like there's a world there's. And there are many ways in which the, these different countries are the same, but there's also a lot of differences between these different countries. So I'll go over that now to kind of give you a better sense of like the complicated, the, the, the bit of the strategic math that we do when we're trying to think about how to uh, approach the different players in a particular country. Uh, let's, start with the Philipp- uh, let's start with the Philippines. I'm based in the Philippines, by the way, so I'm just going to start with this one because this is the one I know best. All right. Uh, one is like, so one, banks in the Philippines. So for banks in the Philippines, um, we're definitely early days in terms of open banking regulation, right? Uh, however, it's like uh, th- th- we seem to have hit a tipping point, like especially last year because of the COVID pandemic, right? And now there's a, this aggressive push from the Philippine Central Banking, with, uh, so from the Philippine Central Bank, the BSP, right, to accelerate basically the digitization of banking services, right? And it's like, they have a lot of program, they have a lot of pro, they have quite a few programs that they're trying to push with different banking, uh, different different bank and financial institution participants, which, uh, which they are, Enabling the uh, you know limited sandboxes and pilot and pilot programs and partnering up with certain people to help make to help kind of like drive the experiment forward right as I as I mentioned early days for open banking for open banking regulation a lot of this stuff is in draft and we're cons- and the BSP is actually consulting with us on drafting this regulation but at the end of the day one thing that's going to, is going to be important is experimentation and iteration. Right, which is why they've opted for a sandbox and a pilot pro- and, a, and a pilot program approach to kind of like get banks on like limited uh, open bank uh, open banking uh, service deployments, right? And Brancas is kind of like a key player. It's sort of like a key player in that one in in those sandboxes and pilot programs because it's like we basically enable these participating banks to start exposing these sorts of APIs, right? Um, uh, so. Uh, in general, most banks in the Philippines have absolutely no API-based digital banking services, right? Uh, except, uh, except for one, which has a really comprehensive, except for one bank that I can think of right now, I think they're, they, they would be classified pretty much as like a tier two bank, right? But in, if you're looking at like the vast majority of all of the banks here in the Philippines, they don't have anything, any, any APIs that could be properly called uh, open banking APIs, basically, right? The small few that do, have kind uh, kinds uh, some sort of digital uh, some sort of uh, API based banking service, right? It's very very limited, and it's like they're kind of considered uh, a fair bit away from being market ready. Like a lot of these are there in experimental stages; they're testing them out with like one to two pilot customers, etc. And uh, there's a lot of like trying to figure out basically how to approach the mar- market and make this API based service, this AS, like digital banking uh, API based digital banking platform, something that is uh, you know market ready, basically, right? Uh, additionally, there's a very strong walled garden mentality here, 
right? So oftentimes a lot with, you'll see with a lot of these API services that are enabled, it's like they only service the bank, right? And so, so for instance, for payments, uh, very rudimentary payment APIs, they only facilitate um, intra-bank fund transfers. So same bank transfers, right? So uh, the, essentially the end user has the flexibility to use their asset, their banking assets and data or, pay, or payments only within the scope of that particular bank. And there's very little incentive. And it's like for them, at the very least for now, it's like they don't see an incentive for them to start kind of like opening that approach up and, and like linking up with other banks, basically. Okay? Uh, in the case of Indonesia, it's actually, um, there's actually a lot of similarities with, with the, in bank in, in the, between Indonesia and the Philippines. Indonesia is also early days in terms of open banking regulation, except like this one is a little bit more imminent. Like I believe that the Bank of Indonesia is planning on implementing initial regulations for open banking starting uh, July 1st, I believe, right? And, but, and Bank of Indonesia is also and I also believe Ojeka, right, especially for the lending side of the equation, is experimenting with soliciting feedback on open banking regulation from fintechs. Like, what are the needs of the fintech industry, for instance, right? So it's like there's a lot of feedback gathering, there's a lot of experimentation, but this is definitely within their within their roadmap and where they want. To, and there will be a mandate where a mandate where banks in Indonesia will have to conform. The exact shape of those, it's like we don't know yet. We're also trying to help out, you know, providing our feedback on those as well, based on our experience, just based on looking at like more advanced open banking models, like say in Europe, for instance, like if you look at open banking UK, or, you know, it's like even the the, the uh, uh, Netherlands own specific uh, open banking policies. Right? Another one is that uh, while Indonesia does have APIs, API based digital banking services. Uh, they are all really geared towards cons uh, the corporations rather than consumers. So it's like this is kind of like the point taken against. Uh, this is so while there are AP digital banking APIs, it's like there, there's a kind of there's a lack there's a bit of a lack here because it's like they seem to be more in service of like corporate clients, corporate account holders, and not really giving end users kind of like the control over like the control over their digital banking access. Uh, other digital banking assets as like what I described earlier as part of like the vision of open banking wherein the end user, the consumer is the owner of their, of their, of their banking assets and data, and they should have the ability to use it however they wish. Right. And also similar with the Philippines, there's a strong walled garden mentality, right? Lots of incumbents here that don't have a lot of incentive to move, uh, to move basically, or to play nice with others basically. Uh, the third country that we're actually very active in is in Thailand. And actually, surprisingly, Thailand is quite advanced in terms of, the, of open banking. I mean, relative to the others, right? Uh, because like the central central banking authorities have been making major pushes here, right? So they're, one thing that they do uh, uh, really excel at is their, payment is their payment infrastructure, right? So payment infrastructure there is very well developed, like interbank fees, like ch switching fees, et cetera, for like sending... Uh, money from bank a to bank b for instance it's like that's uh that basically subsidized by the government and everything right and it's like very high it's like very highly developed but uh, very highly developed in terms of payment infrastructure however for other open banking services other open banking services for instance uh account information for instance uh, for instance or digital account opening this sort of thing it's like those are still kind of th those are still in its nascent stages of development right and it's like that's where we're trying to kind of like make an that's where, where we're also trying to make an impact right so to continue uh to continue with that so that's a kind of like a brief overview of the three countries that we operate in and it's like but we're starting to see kind of like some common patterns some co common patterns in terms of like the issues or the pain points that are emerging whenever we try to come to someone like whether they are on the supply side or the demand side in terms of like you know how this idealized open banking world is supposed to work right on the supply side things that we all that we can't it's like these are just two of the many many things that uh traditional banks and fi say to uh say to us whenever we try to engage them to participate in this larger open banking project that we're trying to enable in these different countries like one is like we don't have apis Right. Or if they, in those cases where we they do have APIs, uh, their APIs don't serve that particular use case, like a particular client's use case. Right. Uh, we see this a lot with a lot of clients who are just kind of like experimenting with API-based digital banking services, especially in the payment space. 
right? So it's like, it oftentimes seems that they it's difficult for them to execute because they treat everything as basically all API all API based banking services that they release as like as a bespoke project for a particular client. Right, because uh, they're always trying to address the specific use case of a particular client, so they have backlogs that will last for the next ten years, and by the time someone and which makes it very very difficult for them to kind of like make a very generalizable standardized API based product that can be brought to brought to the market because of that attitude. Right, uh, I'd say very recently we were trying to engage one particular bank partner who made some who made some. Uh, assumptions about like the na the nature of the engagement that we were trying to uh, the nature of the engagement that we were trying to propose to them right and they assumed incorrectly assumed that we were asking them to custom make special customizations for us like what just one very specific customization like adding a parameter and how that a parameter to their api and how that would be reflected on their database they said basically uh, we, so we approached them early January and they told us basically, okay, so yeah, we definitely want to engage you, but it's like, you're going to have to wait until 2022, basically, right? So uh, that's kind of, and a lot of them, yeah, have difficulty figuring out how to, dis how to scale up these, these like early days uh, API-based services that they're kind of starting to enable. Likewise, on the demand side, right? It's like uh, common things that we hear from fintechs, e-commerce, peer-to-peer lenders, like every other uh, use case that you can think of, right? One thing that they're always going to say, especially on the payment side, bank is that bank APIs are hard, right? I, there is one particular client that we had in the Philippines who basically said, yeah, this one bank that we partnered up with for like this, uh, pay for to use their experimental payment solution, their experimental payment rail. It took them six months to integrate with it, six months to integrate with it. And up to today, th this was a couple of years ago, I think, like maybe one or two, but up to today, they only have that one single direct bank integration to enable that particular payment because of how difficult it was to integrate with them, right? Another one, another one that we oftentimes hear about and uh, is bank APIs are expensive and force you to open an account. Uh, before I get into this one, I'm just going to say that right now that all of these four things that I'm say, I'm putting on the screen. So this this is just a this is just a sample set of like of like the, of the thing, of the common issues that we're seeing. But it's like these are by far one of the largest, right? And they're all interconnected with one another, which is why I selected them. But in the case of bank APIs, are expensive and force you op to open an account, right? It's like this makes it difficult for banks to. It is basically. You can't use their APIs unless you are an, a corporate account holder with this particular bank and those funds from end users, from customers, right, from that bank are being sent to a, to your corporate bank account in the same bank, right? So there's no cross bank payments or anything like that. And the average maintaining balance on top of the, util the utility fees for using that service are quite exorbitant and kind of very... High, highly limit who has who can access those APIs, basically. So it can be rather discriminatory, and uh, I'll get a little bit more into the, into that into an explanation of that in the succeeding slides. But it's on what I mean by discriminatory, right? So uh, I'm going to try to answer these quick fire one by one, basically, kind of like to give you an understanding of like what our problem solving pro or like how we conceptualize the problem based on these four common points of feedback that we got from both of the supply side and demand side. For the supply side, we don't have APIs. We don't have APIs for that particular use case. Our simple answer to that is that, yes, you do, right? If you have a mobile banking API, if you have a mobile banking application, if you have an online banking portal, then you have APIs, right? The problem is not that you don't have APIs. The problem is that you have no way of kind of bringing that to market at the moment, right? And you don't know how to at, in a way that is scalable, basically. But Essentially, by virtue of the fact that these mobile banking APIs and online banking portals exist, these internet banking portals exist, you have APIs and you are serving this particular use and you are serving a particular use case because it is being used by your consumers, right? So it's kind of a moot point. It's like uh, when we say that we don't have open, we don't have these open APIs, it's like our simple answer is to that is like, no, actually, yeah, you do. Uh, the second one is like uh, for the recurring issues. It's like for the demand for the demand for the demand side, right? Bank APIs are hard, and bank APIs are expensive, and force you to open account, right? Uh, to give it's like if I may explain this, if I may explain this problem by way of the solution, right? So one thing that we determined that we identified very early was that 
because of COVID, because of COVID, especially here in the Philippines, Philippines and in 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 Thailand and in Indonesia, right? There's there are a lot of online side hustles that are popping up every, uh, everywhere, left and right, right? It's like social media sellers, micro merchants emerging all over the place that are probably just like uh, purchasing some basic website from a basic website template from like WordPress or, or, or Drupal or something. It's like people who are just trying to get by to survive kind of like the tumultuous times that we live in, right? It's like they don't have any major developer back, uh, the uh, engineering backbone, nor do they have like sophisticated financial operation, uh, financial operations. It's like these are just like normal everyday people who probably just have like a bank account and are trying to have a simple like savings bank account who are trying to find a way to cope with the uh, difficult times that we're all facing. Right, so we created a solution called Broncos Pay that is catered directly to, towards those that particular type of use case, right? Where in precisely these micro, small, uh, you know, social sellers, etc., right? They can they have essentially an auto, it's like a uh, <clears throat> a quick and easy uh, invoicing and uh, invoicing and pay. Uh, and payments solution, right? They can access through the web or through their mobile or through mobile phones, right? And receive payments from any other bank that that Broncos has been integrated, with, right? But this has, but kind of like the rate at which Broncos, uh, Broncos Pay, uh, this product you're seeing right now, Broncos Pay, right, is picking up, right? It has shown us one thing that right, we definitely can simplify. The integration experience and make it easier for people to access these ultimately basic services right and additionally it doesn't have to be exp it, additionally it doesn't have to be expensive i'll get into that I'll, uh but and by expensive i mean by expensive i mean as i mentioned earlier signing up for these apis can be very uh discriminatory because they are pr they prefer corporate uh corporate account holder uh corporate account holders with large mac uh, daily average daily, uh, daily balances, maintaining balances, right? But we were able to find a way to basically make it accessible for these micro merchants who don't have, for these micro merchants who don't have a lot in their savings, in their in their accounts and are just using it as a basic receivables, but still nonetheless deserve these modern payment, these modern payment facilities, right? And it's like, there is a way, and one thing that we discovered uh, fairly quickly is that there is a way to serve both, like not just like the interest of these micro merchants, right? But also of the banks as well through this particular use case, right? So I'm going to go into that in greater detail. So, in this so, uh, so yeah. Luis, um, just, just quickly. So I, I guess in this e example, you're, you are the, um, you're helping financial institutions to scale because some of these um, uh, merchants that um, are considered um, either either low value by the financial institution or a high cost to serve um, yes, exactly. through, their, through their current methods uh, can, yes. can, can be reached. Um, mm -hmm. we, we are running up against time. So can you, um, can you, uh, uh, do you have another, do you have a summary slide or what? Yeah, sure. The... I can, so I can go through this really quickly. Okay. So the way that we've addressed all four problems is basically first one, we, it's like we were able, it's like for banks, uh, I don't have APIs. What we essentially, what we're doing is essentially with them, it's like treat us like building partnerships with banks, essentially saying treat Broncos Direct as a first party application and we will create the exposure layer for you that will allow you to safely expose what would otherwise be first party service, uh, first party API services to third parties. Right, so it's like we created this interface, uh, this generic interface that conforms to the authentication and authorization mechanisms of the bank. Provide end users a secure feat, uh, a secure mechanism through which they can authenticate and authorize transactions with their banks. Right, so that banks can use essentially what they have on hand in terms of the API services, the exact same API services that are servicing their first party applications. Right, in terms of the second problem, right, it's like of of uh, complicated use cases, right? We simplified that basically. Banks only need to provide the basic service of moving money from point A to point B. Everything after that, everything on top of that, in order to address a particular use case, can be accomplished by Brancas via front-end APIs, right? That are customized, uh, that are can be cost that we can 
quickly iterate on and customize for our customers, but are still fundamentally accessing the exact same backend APIs of the bank to just do basic things, retrieve a statement, perform a payment, basically. Right. In terms of the demand side, the way that as I, the way that we solved it is that we've completely abstracted the integrations layer from the customer. Customers, in order to gain access to these banking rail to these banking fund transfer rails, they simply need to call a single endpoint from Brancas Direct, right? And that's just to create the transaction, the the payment request to Brancas Direct. After that, Brancas Direct handles everything else, from end user authentication to the actual orchestration of the funds itself, accessing banks' uh, first party API, uh, first party APIs. And the last one, um, yeah, yes. So yeah, we basically completely abstract all of that complexity and just make it more easily accessible to our customers, right? But in summary, yeah, open banking still has a long way to go, but the thing that, but, but and the, the road to that will be like long and very grueling. We have no illusions about that, but the basic building blocks are there and we are seeing a lot of buy-in from central banking authorities and regulators to not just build modern, but inclusive banking systems. Right. But what is key right now is cooperation between financial institutions, regulators, and fintechs to build up the framework for what that system is going to look like. And above all, there needs to be an urgency to start experimenting and iterating with this now, getting a, a very uh, minimum viable product out into the market and just seeing it's like, okay, does this work? If not, where else do we go? Basically. And so, that's basically it. Okay, thanks, thanks very much, uh, Luis.